Welcome to Training Unleashed, the show that will help you design and deliver training that's off the chain and will make a difference. Now, here's your host, Evan Hackle. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting edition of Training Unleashed. We are very lucky today to have C. Lee Smith, the CEO of Sales Fuel, with us. They are based out of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they are ranked as one of the top 15 sales enabled vendors by Selling uh, Power Magazine. By the way, if you like Selling Power Magazine and if you like the topic of fuel, Lee's got a terrific offer for everybody at the end. Uh, He's got a big bio here, but, you know, bottom line is we need to get his content and hear from him. So, Lee, just briefly, you know, maybe just give us a little bit about you and how you, what inspired you to get into into starting Sales Fuel. Well, I started off, well, thanks, it's, it's great to be on the show. And, and uh, I started off as a salesperson uh, about 30 some odd years ago. And, uh, you know, it was apparent to me then that uh, I felt very uncomfortable with small talk. Uh, which people who know me would find that very odd. But it's like, you know, I, you know, tended to be more of an introvert back then. And, you know, so what I found, though, was there were certain topics that I could t- talk about that both they and I, they being the customer, and I had a common interest in, and that was how to make more money. And so what I tried to do was to understand their business well enough to read the same trade magazines that, you know, that they read, the same newsletters at the time back when they came in the mail, uh, you know, that they did. And I would you know, highlight, rip and read, put them in the, into folders and things of that nature so that I always have something new to talk about uh, and some new value to add. Even before it was, the idea of you know, showing up and providing value as a salesperson was cool, I was doing it. And it was apparent, it, apparent to me then that most salespeople weren't doing that but could benefit greatly from it. And that was the, at the advent when consultative sales really started becoming a thing. And so that's how I started the company. And so for Fast forward 30 years, we are a sales enablement company and a multi-million dollar company. And uh, we do business intelligence for anybody that, do, that sells to small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, that's our specialty. We also then have a coaching platform, though, uh, that, which is what, really what I'm excited to talk to you about today because I believe that coaching is a really critical part of learning and the work that the trainers do every day and so much of, uh, of what they do is lost. Uh, even within 24 hours, but you know, a lot of what's left over, you know, ends up being lost without the proper reinforcement, uh, the right sustainment. Uh, and so, what I'm, what we're trying to do with the coaching platform is make it easier then for sales managers to follow up and reinforce then all the good sales training that our sales enablement folks do out there. Well, I think you're really hitting on a very important point. You know, training is not a one-shot wonder. Right. There's not like, oh, here, we trained you on this. Now you're an expert. It is a process and, mm-hmm. and learning is a process. And um, it's very interesting. My very last guest was a coach also. And it sounds like you have a very formalized program and process. Maybe tell us a little bit more about what, what you do and what you recommend that people do. When it, when it comes to coaching. Well, I want to start off with the benefits of actually having a formalized process. There's a company called CSO Insights then that does a lot of sales research uh, for the industry. And they came out with some stats a couple of years ago that, that show that companies that have a formal sales process are increase their win rates of their sales reps by 35% more than those who just leave it up to the managers to coach however they, you know, however they see fit. They don't have a process, a procedure, a policy a philosophy, if you will. Uh, and so that's why to do it. So specifically about what one of the things that we do here with Sales Fuel Coach is that we've combined the principles of adaptive learning and micro learning and we applied them to sales coaching to create what I call adaptive sales coaching. And the concept there is that every sales rep is different. They all have different needs. They all have different things they do well, don't do well, things they like to do, they don't like to do, and, uh, you know, and things that they want to learn more about. Uh, and of course, then you as a manager, then you have things that you want them to learn about, and they're all different. And if you try to coach them all the same with a formalized process, that doesn't, that's not so effective either. Uh, you have a bunch of, you know, people say there's no I in team. I would argue and say there's a lot of I's in team. Uh, there, there's nothing but I's in team. 
uh, and so from the, the trick is you have to get them all to work together. But before you can do that, you have to understand who they are individually. And so we start with scientific assessments right up front where we analyze uh, skill gaps in sales skills, in people skills, which is a big un overlooked topic. Even though people like Tom Peters, for example, have been talking about for 30 years, uh, you know, it's still an overlooked topic and, and something that, you know, some managers think, oh, that's soft, squishy stuff or whatever. And, you know, well, that's really the hard stuff. And that's, that's and, and for sales, you know, people say that sales is a results business. And sales is really a people business. You know, we're in this business to help other people, to help them overcome their problems, to achieve their goals. And, and hopefully they, and, and hopefully then the products that we are selling, um, uh, have a key role into that so that we're making you know, everyone making some money off the deal too. And so we start there with, with the scientific assessments. We also then try to figure out you know, how they behave, how they like to communicate. Uh, for me, understanding their motivation though is a real key aspect of this. And you know, from that, you know, sales managers are always trying to incentivize the salespeople to go out there and sell more, to do things that are, you know, that are uncomfortable uh, for them. And to do that, you really have to understand, you know, why do they do the things that they do? I mean, if, if you know what they do, uh, you know, that's one thing. But understanding why they do it, uh, that's where a manager can really be totally effective. Uh, I think it was uh, Jim Rohn that, that said that philosophy leads to attitude. Attitude uh, leads to activity. Activity leads to results. And results lead to, life, lead to lifestyle. Uh, salespeople spend a lot of time thinking about the lifestyle. Sales managers spend a lot of time trying to manage then the activity and the results, the stuff that's in the CRM. You know, and they say, oh, you're not making enough cold calls or you're not, you're not doing enough new business discovery or we're not, you know, we're not reaching out and trying to grow our existing accounts enough. Uh, and the thing is where those sales managers can be really effective is on that front end by talking about the, the, you know, by understanding the, the sales philosophy, the personal philosophies of a person and the, uh, the attitude. Uh, do they believe in themselves? They believe in their, uh, do they trust their manager? They believe in the company? They believe in the product line? Uh, do they see things you know, in a positive lens or a negative lens? Do they have a, a view? You know, they, when they think about things, do they think about how that impacts them first? Or do they think about how it impacts other people? And understanding all those interesting dynamics, uh, I think, is really the key part of adaptive sales coaching. For that matter, adaptive learning as well. If you know those things, then what we can do is we can tailor the coaching just like you would tailor the, the learning process uh, for what they need and, 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 get, and what's most relevant to them and serve that to them first. And so that's the adaptive part. And then lastly, the micro learning part is breaking things in, in this small bite-sized chunks that you can, you can feed them a lot of small bite-sized chunks so that you're regular, you're consistent. Uh, repetition is a mother of mastery, as they say in education. I like to believe that it's consistency as a father. And so this provides you the consistency and that repeti repetition, but do it in small size chunks so that you're not taking a salesperson out of the field continuously to attend classroom sessions or watch videos or something like that. You're serving them up in five to seven minute chunks. And that's what we do. And Sales Fuel Coach on that platform, we call that quick coaching. Uh, so the idea is that we don't want them off the street. And so we, we, we put all of this into a SaaS platform. Uh, and so that, that managers can come and instantly find out what they need to know, what are the differences between each person, what are the coaching points for each person, what should I be talking about in my one-on-one -on -one meetings to for follow up, uh, you know, what, and you know, what, should I, what training should I be reinforcing during the day, and you know, what accounts do they want to go after, and how can I walk them through the sales process and help them do it better? And that's really so, what we try to do. Lee, that sounds interesting. I find stories are amazing. Can you share with me a success story? of somebody that you've worked with and, and how this has sort of turned things around and why? So one of the things is that we use this, we use this in our own company. Uh, we, of course, and we, we, we sell quite a bit of it as well. We've got lots of success stories for, you know, for our 30 year, our, our 30 year process. Um, but for us, it's like, you know, one of the ways in which we've used it, I think is the most interesting is, is we also talk about sales culture and, you know, I like to think of culture as sort of like, you know, why does one uh, plant or species or whatever thrive in one area, but if you move it to another area, it dies. I mean, so, you know, you, you can grow something in California, but you move it to Ohio, it's colder or whatever. Why does it not thrive there? And, and somebody else's garden, same, same plant. So just like a salesperson, same person, but why does it thrive in one area, not the other? It's either one of two things. It's the environment it's the soil or it's the weather or something like that. Or in the case of business, it's the culture or it's the gardener. In this case, it's a direct manager. 
So one of the things that we we found is like that, uh, you know, we, we had our sales enablement person who was, uh, you know, doing our HubSpot system and doing our, uh, uh, doing our outbound marketing and all that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, we started asking you know, her coaching questions, you know, just like we would do you know, through using the sales fuel coach system. We come to find out, though, that's like, you know, that's interesting. She's really, she could be really good at sales. And we dug a little deeper. It's like, oh, but her dad has been a salesperson for, for many years. It's like, but she's never really thought about going in, in, into the sales business. She's always kind of fancying herself as a, as a marketer. And uh, we, our, our sales manager, director of sales, took her under her wing. And uh, lo and behold, now she's our second best. Uh, well, it depends on the day. It's either second best or third best salesperson we got. And uh, so that's one area where we were able to take somebody then who didn't even really know uh, how they could be developed and really didn't know what they were capable of. But, you know, we had all the analysis you know, from, from the assessments. You know, we saw the, what she was doing on our current job. We knew that she wanted to make more money, and we wanted to give her the opportunity to do that to advance her career. And it just so happens then we had a need for a salesperson. Actually, we didn't have a need at the time. We actually created a new position for her. And, uh, and she's taken that, and uh, she won't let go of it. And, you know, there, there's an example of, yeah, you know, sometimes the best salesperson that, that, that you need to hire, you already have. And that's what happened in our situation, how we use Sales Fuel Coach. You know, it's kind of interesting you say, I, I would assume a lot of your clients use it in the screening process for hiring. That's true. And, you and, know, the, I, I always like to say the best time to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to know what makes your salespeople tick is before you hire them. The second best time is right now. <laughs> that's a great point. That's a, ver- that's a very good point. So you've used two terms. I like to dig into them a little bit more. You use the term adaptive learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a very popular term. How would you describe it? How I would describe it is to, um, it's an individualized, it's a personalized approach to education, uh, to instructional. So your instructional design is not based off of a classroom. It's not based on an audience. It's based on an audience of one. And so it's going to be different for every single person based off of what their individual needs are. So an example of that in sales sometimes is that we'll want to put uh, the entire sales staff through training and we'll want them to be masters at, at our elevator pitch or, you know, or uh, overcoming a key objection. We want to make sure that they all read off the same script and we turn them into little robots. Uh, you know, that's fine and good. But, you know, what, what if... And so happens like we already had two members of our sales staff that are experts at overcoming objections. So now we're forcing them, taking them off the street. We're forcing them to actually sit down and do stuff aware that they already, quite frankly, they're thinking they could, they could teach the class. And, you know, and they're not getting a lot of value out of it. And so how does that impact everybody else? Uh, then you'll have some people, whatever, that, you know, do get a lot of, a lot of value at it. And that's great. And some that are in between. And so, but instead of the people that are really good at objections, boy, they really need help on discovery. They don't spend enough time getting to know the business, getting to know uh, the buyer as a person and why, why change is important to them and what's in it for them. And they don't spend nearly enough time there and that hurts their close rate. So, yeah, maybe. And so I look at it as instead of spending, making that person go through a classroom session where everybody learns all the same stuff, it's like, those people could learn more about discovery in the same amount of time that other people are learning about how to overcome key objections from the company. So to me, it's a very individualized, very personalized approach uh, to learning that, 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 that is more relevant than to the student than, than what we've done traditionally. We're so glad you're listening to this episode of Training Unleashed, brought to you by Tortal Training. The difference between Tortal Training and other online training companies is we're primarily a training company with technology rather than a technology company that does training. Want to find out more? Just go to Tortal.net. That's T-O-R-T-A-L, Tortal.net. So as I sit here and I listen to you, you know, it's very easy to say, yeah, totally makes sense. You know, train people on what they need. Focus, focus completely on them. In large organizations, that's difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, I noticed earlier you talked about you focus on small, medium-sized organizations. Does this process apply to large organizations? Is your software the secret sauce that enables it to happen more effectively? How do, how do people bring this into their organizations? Well, I like to think the answer is yes. And, and here's how I've, I view large organizations. Large organizations are really com- are, are collections of smaller teams. 
So it's like you, I mean, the average sales manager, for example, a, a, a manages eight people. You know, whether that's, a, that's, that's in large organizations as well as small ones. And so uh, in the large organizations, you also have sales enablement uh, specialists that you don't have in a small organization. So they have a lot more support staff to help them out as well. But it's, a, it's a, just a collection of smaller teams. And so one of the things that we look at when we measure sales culture is we look at the sales culture from the team perspective. So each team has their own sales culture because, you know, the person who has the most direct impact on that culture is the manager. So each manager has his or her own culture. And you add all that up, and that's one of the things I laugh about. It's like, well, we need to have a strong company culture. Yes, you do, but the thing is your company culture is really a collection of, you know, smaller micro cultures, if you will, that you know, each manager has their own culture. And that's why some managers would have people that are trying to get into the departments and knocking the doors down, and you have other managers where people can't get away from them fast enough. So uh, my goal, of course, is to make our, man our managers the, the former rather than the latter. And so that's, uh, I, I believe that it definitely can be work for the, the bigger ones as well as the smaller ones. Why I like to work with small to medium-sized businesses because that's what we've done for 30 years. I'm, you know, and, and you know, we would be classified as a company under 500 employees and uh, as a small to medium-sized business. And uh, you know, I really have a, a, a passion for helping people that do what I do. I have done what I, I've done as an entrepreneur thrive and grow. And you know, because the odds are not in our favor. You know, so when you get somebody that's made it past the three-year mark and, and now they're trying to grow, maybe they get a round of funding or something like that. Now they've got to grow a sales staff. And now the sales staff, you know, you can't rely on a sales staff, just everyone going out and doing their own thing anymore. You know, we have to provide a methodology and we have to provide training. We have to provide coaching and development. And then we want to be able to keep the good people that we have after we've developed them. We don't want to be developing people for our competition. So... You know, all of that stuff becomes magnified and becomes a lot more important the, the bigger that you grow. But for us, I, we like to think our sweet spot is, are, is the emerging uh, small to medium-sized businesses that, that are growing. And that's who I like to work with. That's where I get energized. Will I work with a large company? Yes, I have. We have some of the largest media companies in the United States as clients, large ad agencies as well. And we love working with them too. It's a different challenge. But, you know, I, I tend to gravitate toward the smaller ones. No, it's it's interesting. I'm in the middle of reading the book David versus Goliath uh, by Gladwell. I don't know if you've read it or mm. not, but what you know what it really focuses on is that bigger companies get so immersed in bureaucracy and and that they just aren't nimble and they, and mm. that that there's an efficiency as they grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it grows to a point where there's a disefficiency, dis mm -hmm. which is interesting. And I, I would I would argue that bigger companies that act like smaller companies like you described is probably a smart thing. It's desirable. It's not exactly achievable. It's, it's, it's difficult. It really is. It's like you know, the older company, an older company is, it's like you have the gravity of history. And then the larger you are, you have the gravity of your size. And it's like, sometimes it's like turning a barge around in the river. It's like I grew up on the river. So I can, I can envision that. Those of you who haven't, it's like, you know, try to imagine something. Uh, very <laughs> long, arduous, and slow. Um, you know, so, you know, your culture didn't get the way it is overnight and fixing your culture is not going to happen overnight either. And same thing goes with training. So if you're trying to do something different in training, uh, well, you know, you have the gravity of history that, well, we've always done it this way. And I, and I cringe whenever people say that. And most of you do too. And, but, but the thing is, is that it takes much longer for me to make a sale to a large organization, uh, that wants to apply this to, to a large number of people than it does to a smaller, more nimble organization, because, one of the first things I like to stress to some of our, you know, our, our clients that are under 500 employees is like your chief advantage is that you are small, agile, and nimble. Don't make decisions. Don't put in policies or whatever that, that restrict that and make yourself because you've taken away your key advantage in going up against the big guys because you're trying to be just like them. Yeah, you're becoming just like them in the wrong ways. And so uh, that's another reason why I think we've been more successful in working with those under 500 employees because they can make decisions in our favor a lot quicker. Yeah, no doubt about it. So we're, we're going to run out of time. Everyone, of course, wants to hear about your offer. But first, my question always is, if you had to give one tip to the people listening, what would that one tip be? Hmm, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I would s just remind people then that everybody takes in information and shares information in a different way. And everybody has different motivations for, for how they make decisions and for how they act. 
And if you as a trainer can adapt your delivery, you know, to each individual person, you know, to how they really like to receive information and what, and how their mo and what their motivations are for being in that, that room with you, uh, you're going to have maximum impact that way. If you treat everybody the same, uh, that, that's not going to work uh, nearly as well. You can be, a, you can be effective, but I, I would say then to adapt your communication uh, and adapt your delivery uh, to each individual person. If you can't do that, if you're in a large classroom session and try to figure out, okay, I have a majority of people who you know, tend to be you know, fast-paced, you know, type A personalities, uh, or I have, you know, I have a bunch of nerds in my classroom or something like that, where you're going to have to adapt your delivery then to the, to the majority of the classroom then so that they get more out of it. So I, w I would definitely start there, but I also would give a second piece of advice, which would be, uh, you know, don't just, you know, your, your job doesn't end when the, when the training class is over and evals come back and you get all fives. That's great, but keep in mind that, that you know, the stat about 70% of what is learned is lost in 24 hours. And just keep in mind that, that uh, you have to have a strategy for sustainment after that and positive reinforcement, and that's how you have to get their direct managers involved. They can't skip out on training. I know that aggravates the hell out of people uh, you know, when, when managers treat training as a, as a babysitting service. Uh, they have to show up. They have to participate in the training because they have to reinforce the training. And, but that's done through coaching, and that's done through constant development, and that's, that has to be part of your sustainment strategy. I got to tell you something. Two great tips. Um, managers that don't go to training is a huge issue because they don't even know what's being trained. I know. It's, 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 it's sad. So let's get to your offer. Um, please uh, share with everyone what your offer is and I think people are going to be pretty excited. So Sales Fuel Coach is the adaptive sales uh, coaching platform. And uh, it has the quick coach that I mentioned about all, all the things about the one-on-ones. All the assessments I talked about, it's all bundled in, into that same software package. We'd really like to show it to you. Uh, and, you know, so if you come over then to salesfuel.com uh, slash coach, uh, you can also then just click on Sell Smarter and pick Sales Fuel Coach from there. And, uh, you know, then request a, uh, re request a, a, a demo and we'll show you that we'll ask you a bunch of questions about your organization and how you guys do sales coaching currently. Uh, we'll show you the, the product and, uh, and then just for your time then and, and, and sharing your thoughts with us, uh, we're going to give you a free one year subscription to selling power magazine. So, uh, that's a, that's a digital only comes out monthly. Fantastic content It is really the Bible of the sales industry. Uh, another one is another great one is sales and marketing management. They're terrific too. Uh, but this one, this one is for uh, selling power magazine and, uh, we'll give that to you just for, uh, taking a look at the, see what we have to offer and, and offering us your thoughts on, on, you know, some of your challenges that you have with, with coaching and development in your organization. Uh, Lee, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to give you a plug. Uh, and that is some of you are probably listening and saying, I'm not even sure what this software would do. And I would encourage all of you to take Lee up on this offer because what technology can do, the enablement, the planning, going right back to the beginning of what you said, where 35% improvement in sales for people that have a process, it's so important. So take this time to, to, to really learn what this type of technology can do. Even if it's not right for you, the education will be well worth it. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, Selling Power Magazine is great magazine. Yeah, so, I appreciate that, Evan. I think the other thing I, I, I can throw out there is that we have a white paper on adaptive sales coaching. So it explains the process a little bit more in depth. A lot of great stats in there as well. Uh, if you click on resources, white papers, you can get, get the free white paper download uh, from salesfuel.com. Uh, it's a really nice white paper we did on, on adaptive sales coaching. It kind of helps explain the concept a little better. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for being a guest. I very much appreciate having you on the show. And you were a great guest on the Manage Smarter podcast. I should mention to everybody like that. We, we had Evan on, on our show, whatever. He was terrific. So you guys want to make sure that you listen in on that. Uh, that's going to be coming up shortly uh, you know, at managesmarter.com. Well, thank you. I enjoyed being on your show. And, uh, you know, it's always great. I love interviewing people. I also love being interviewed. So it was a good show. I yeah, I did too. I enjoyed being interviewed today too. It's like, it's <laughs> nice to be on the other side of the microphone. Yes, it is. Take care, everyone. This has been Training Unleashed, but it doesn't stop here. Just go to trainingunleashed.net to subscribe to the show. That way you'll never miss an episode and you'll be well on your way to delivering training programs that are off the chain. We'll talk to you next time on Training Unleashed.